Buonasera, buonasera a tutti. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are gathered here for one uh, of our incontri a Palazzo, and I have the distinct honor and the pleasure of introducing Professor Ramon Soldiver to you tonight. Professor Soldiver, to me, the most important thing about Professor Soldiver is that he's my boss. <laughs> so when you talk to him during the reception, say wonderful <laughs> things about me at all times. So at all times, so make sure you, you know. But um, is here on site with his wife, Professor Moya, and with his colleague, Professor Marcus, and is teaching a class, co-teaching a class with them on the gardens of Florence, which the students love. I had a general meeting with the students a couple of days ago, and when I mentioned that class, I said, oh, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Um, Professor Heldiver has been at Stanford for a very long time, so I'll try to read through his uh, Vita, and I'm going to have to skip a number of things that he's done, because he's been at Stanford for over 20 years, uh, more or less as I have. So he is a professor of English and comparative literature, <coughs> and the Hoagland Family Professor of Humanities and Sciences, at Stanford. He's also Bass University Fellow in Undergraduate Studies and has served as Chair of the Department of English and the Department of Comparative Literature also at Stanford. Professor Saldivar then, as I told you before, is the Director of all of the programs that uh, Stanford operates the world over. So his title there is the Burke Family Director of the Bank Overseas Studies Program at Stanford. That means that he oversees Florence, but he oversees Santiago, Chile, Cape Town in South Africa, uh, Berlin, all of the programs that Stanford has in the world. His teaching and research focus on the areas of literary criticism and literary theory, the history of the novel, the 19th and early 20th century literary studies, cultural studies, globalizations, and mainly, as of lately really, issues concerning, concerning transnationalism, Chicano and Chicana studies. In 2012, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama. And a year later, uh, Obama appointed him to a six-year term on the National Council of the Humanities. So Lieber is a, also a recipient of the very prestigious Dinkelspiel Award at Stanford, which is given to people who make distinctive contributions to undergraduate uh, teaching. He's also received other awards. I'm not going to read through them all, otherwise we'll end this intro at seven. By the same token, I'm not going to read his uh, the many publications that he has written. There are many, many articles on the board, on editorial boards of magazines of the, of the Stanford University Press uh, and on, of a number of scholarly journals. Let me uh, cite some of his uh, books. And uh, one of them is titled Figural Language in the Novel, The Flowers of Speech from Cervantes to Joyce. Another one is called Chicano Narrative, Dialectics of Difference. Uh, yet another is on the borderlands of culture, Americo Paredes and the Transnational Imaginary. This came out with Duke University in 2006. It was also awarded a prize from the MLA as the best book in the area of Chicano Chicano studies. Uh, uh, he also co-edited with uh, Laura Beaver and Johannes Bills, the Imaginary and Its Worlds, American Studies After the Transnational Term. This came out from the, with the University Press of New England in 2013. He is currently at work on two new book projects. One is uh, on race, narrative theory, and contemporary American fiction. The other one is still on Americo Paredes, but uh, it focuses on the post-war writings from Asia. Let me also mention that Professor Saldiver was uh, from 1994 to 1999 the Vice Provost for, uh, um, for Undergraduate Education at Stanford. That was a, an office uh, uh, a position that was created at that time. He was the first VPU at Stanford and somebody who uh, made some very critical changes to the whole of the undergraduate education at Sanford, some of which are still standing today. 
So it's a pleasure to have Professor Saldivar with us in Florence for a full quarter, and it is a true pleasure to have Professor Saldivar as our director of all. So thank you for, for accepting this invitation. Well, you, you must be thinking what I'm thinking, and that is when you have people who work with you, like doing the company, you know, it doesn't take much to be a, a boss because they do all the work and they do it so beautifully. Uh, part of the pleasure for me being here in Florence has been seeing, you know, the vaunted reputation of this center being played out day by day, minute by minute, and the wonderful work that you do. So thanks for having me here. Can you hear me okay? It's kind of hard to tell from here. Okay? Is that okay? Can you? Can you okay, good. Um, if, I, if I start drifting away from, from the microphone and, you, and I'm fading out, please let me know. And uh, the reason I can't see my clock is because I haven't put my glasses on. <laughs> but it's amazing what a difference glasses make. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Well, as Linda said, the title of my talk is Machiavelli in the Caribbean and the Art of Power. And you must be thinking, Machiavelli, Caribbean, the Americas, what, what's the connection here? Well, it refers, my talk, the title of my talk today refers to the very interesting historical fact that right at the time that Niccolò Machiavelli was writing The Prince um, in, the, uh, in the newly discovered land soon to be known as the Americas, something else was happening. Hernán Cortés uh, was enacting some of the very ideas concerning how power is manifested, how power acts, and why one uses it in certain ways. Um, the, the, you know, the very ideas that Machiavelli was writing about so powerfully uh, in his book, at the very same time, in other words. My thesis is therefore not one of influence. I'm not saying that Cortés had read the French before he left to conquer uh, the Americas, but rather that the ideas of political power developed in the European Renaissance would offer the template for imperial conquest and political domination in the New World. How and why that is the case is what I'm going to talk to you about. So here we go. Late in the winter of 1517, as he was riding in Principe, the prince, Machiavelli wrote um, to his friend Ludovico Alamani. Um, we have that letter that's available to us. And he told him, to, uh, um, uh, uh, Machiavelli tells his friend Alamani that he had just finished reading a new poem by um, uh, by Ludovico Ariosto, and that it was going to be one of the masterpieces of the Italian Renaissance. Um, Machiavelli says in his, says in his letter um, to, to his friend, I've just read Orlando Curioso by, Ari by Ari Ariosto, and truly the poem is beautiful throughout. If you run into him, tell him that I'm only sorry that having spoken about so many poets like a prick, he left me out. Now, please pardon the profanity, the profane, profane language, but I'm only quoting Machiavelli. He really did say that. Okay, the letter. Um, let's see, where am I going to put that in? The letter of Giovanni tells us a lot about Machiavelli. For one thing, he was right about Ariosto. Orlando Curioso is a magnificent poem. Those of you who are Renaissance scholars here and fans who read it, it's about war and love and the romantic ideal of chivalry. But it's a very important historical poem because it tells the story of Charlemagne and of Orlando Roland in the English and French tradition, and the Franks as they battle against the Saracens, the Muslims, who have invaded Europe and are attempting to overthrow Christian Empire. It's the first modern instance, in other words, of the true battle between Christianity and, and Islam in the West. Ariosto also coined the term humanism in Italian, humanismo, for choosing to focus upon the strengths and the potential of humanity rather than only upon its role as a subordinate to God. So Machiavelli's ability to recognize Ariosto and his work as a masterpiece tells us a, a number of things. He's familiar with the classics of Renaissance humanist education. He knows the popular literature of his day, because Ariosto's poem was you know, popular literature. It was written in, the, in, the, in, in Italian, not in Latin. Um, he has read Petrarch, Dante, and obviously Ariosto. He thinks enough of his own poetic talents that he considers himself worthy of being listed among the most important poets of the age, and that's why he's angry that you know, he's not listed. 
And he could predict that the poem, Ariosto's poem, really was going to be one of the most important literary works of the European 16th century. At the time, Machiavelli was in exile in the beautiful countryside of Tuscany. He was bored with the quiet pastoral life of contemplation that had been forced upon him because he had backed the wrong political faction with the fall of the Republic in Florence in 1512. He was also afraid that this would be his new life permanently, away from the world of political activity that had been the center of his life, which he loved so much. However, the image of Machiavelli that has come down to us today is not that of a poet or a man of great letters who wrote, you know, these wonderful books, Mandragola, The Discourses, The Art of War, or The History of Florence. Apart from the prince, um, uh, uh, Machiavelli wrote all of those things, so he was a prolific man of letters. But we see him today as something else, as the very image, not of the great man of letters, of the sophisticated esteem that he could have been, but as the very image of the poisoner politician, an immoral hypocrite, an even sleazier version of the unethical politicians that make our own daily forays into the news or entertaining. Even by the end of the 16th century, you know, just a short time after Machiavelli has died, a Machiavellian type had already developed. Christopher Marlowe, the great English dramatist, for instance, in his play The Jew of Malta, for a um, uh, play having to do with religion, with politics, and poison, opens with these words, which I put up on the board for you on, the, on, on my slide. To some, says Marlowe in the preface, uh, speaking in Machiavelli's voice, to some my name is odious. Though some speak openly against my books, yet they will read me, and thereby attain to Peter's chair, in other words, to the Pope, to the Pates. And when they cast me off, are poisoned by my followers. I count religion but a childish toy, and hold there is no ignorance, no sin ladder but ignorance, no sin but ignorance. Machiavelli's ideas have been reduced to this by, by Marvel's time. The best example of the Machiavellian uh, stereotype of a hypocrite politician is one offered a little bit later by the British historian Edward Hyde, Earl of Clarendon, who in his 1647 history of the rebellion of the English Civil Wars describes the notorious Puritan general and leader Oliver Cromwell during the English Civil Wars as a Machiavel. And he has this to say about uh, uh, Machiavelli, Cromwell and Machiavelli. Cromwell, says Hyde, was a Machiavel. He first considered what was absolutely necessary to their end, and then whether right or wrong, to make all other means subservient to it. Cromwell, though the greatest dissembler living, always made his hypocrisy of singular use and benefit to him, and never did anything, however ungracious or imprudent, imprudent, so ever it seemed to be, but what was necessary to his design. Even his roughness and his unpolishedness, which he affected, was necessary. So, hypocrite, dissembler, affectation, this is what a Machiavelli a Machiavel is. By 1559, within Machiavelli's own Latin, in other words, his book was placed on the list of prohibited books by the Inquisition in Rome and was therefore forbidden to Catholics to read, even though secretly it was widely read. So today, a Machiavelli is someone who is unscrupulous, cunning player of power politics, someone who is maybe a brilliant tactician, but who governs according to the dictates of necessity rather than morality, someone who does not hesitate to use force and fraud, lies and betrayal to serve his purposes, like a character of Frank Underwood for the TV fans in the Netflix television series House of Cards. He's a perfect example of a contemporary Machiavelli. From, from correspondence and surviving, uh, there are seven surviving manuscripts of Machiavelli's book, a version appears to have been distributed as early as 1513 in manuscript form, was passed around from person to person, using the Latin title De Principatibus, of Principalities. The printed version was not published until 1532 under the title of the Prince, but by that point, you know, it was already very widely read and very well known. Other writers of the Renaissance dreamed about a perfect society and about ideal men. 
Thomas More in Utopia, or Rabelais in the Abbe de Tillen chapter in Gargantua and Patrick Rowe, for example, offered hypothetical ideal theories of government and the governed. Machiavelli, by contrast, offered Renaissance writers a way of thinking about politics in the rough and tumble real world, not the ideal, not the abstract, but in the way it's actually practiced. He was the modern political realist. Since my intention, says uh, Machiavelli and the Prince, since my intention is to say something that will prove of practical use to the inquirer, I have thought it proper to represent things as they are in real truth, rather than as they are imagined. Therefore, if a prince wants to maintain his rule, he must be prepared not to be virtuous. Machiavelli was reviled, he was attacked, he was banned, as I've said, and he was misrepresented but he was also appropriated. He was used by other thinkers and politicians precisely because his work responded to many of the central problems of his age. Problems such as, what is the legitimate basis of political power? How do you acquire and maintain power? What is the relationship between force and ethics? Is it possible to make a cold, steely analysis and criticism of the status quo and do something about it? Machiavelli offers an early version of modern political theory for a time when politics is increasingly becoming, once again, as in classical times, within, with the end of the European Middle Ages, secular. Yet, despite the informal, casual, and style and tone that Machiavelli cultivates in the prince, it is obviously intended to impress, to impress at least one person, namely Lorenzo de Medici, Lorenzo di Piero de Medici, the grandson of uh, Lorenzo di Magnifico, to whom the book is dedicated. Originally, the book was dedicated to another Medici, Giuliano di Lorenzo di Medici, young Lorenzo's nephew. But, unfortunately, Giuliano died while Machiavelli was writing the dedication, you know, right at the very time that he had written it. So what does Machiavelli do? He calls back all the manuscripts that are in circulation, takes off that dedication, and puts in a different one. Waste a good book by dedicating it to a dead guy? Not our boy. Instead, Machiavelli quickly changed the dedication to Lorenzo de Piero de Medici, as I said, Giuliano's nephew, who was incidentally also the nephew of the very powerful Giovanni de Medici, who had just become, in 1513, Pope Leo X, one of the most powerful men in Europe. So, through his blunt, business like, even everyday colloquial style, Machiavelli really does wish to shock his readers. He wants them to see um, that abstract utopian ideals, abstract utopian ideals of government are all well and good, but when you get down to real, hardcore politics, you have to pay attention to the voice of practical experience, not theory. And what was the basis of this practical understanding and experience? This question arose for Machiavelli as a real-world historical problem from the context of the political crisis that he was witnessing exploding around him. In 1494, the French had invaded the Italian peninsula, leading eventually to the collapse of the French Republic in 1512, I mean, excuse me, the, the Republic in Florence in 1512. These events brought him to the role of fraud and force in the sphere of politics and the realities of cold, ruthless political power. Machiavelli did not invent Machiavellian politics, in other words. He simply codified and put into words the practices that he saw all around him. He sets aside ethical issues and emphasizes the power of artful rhetoric and manipulative style as he gives practical advice on how to say one thing but mean another. In other words, figures of speech. How to act one way while being prepared to change course completely, with irony sometimes and sometimes just much more bluntly, dishonesty. This rhetorical strategy is what gives the term Machiavellian its contemporary meaning of a politics that is two-faced, duplicitous, and hypocritical. As he puts it at one, at one point, this is Machiavelli speaking, uh, he says in chapter 18, you must understand, says Machiavelli, that there are two ways of fighting, by law or by force. The first way is natural to men, and the second to beasts. So a prince must understand how to make nice use of the beast and the man. 
The ancient writers taught this by an allegory. When they describe how Achilles was sent to be brought up by Chiron, the, the centaur, all that allegory means in making the teacher half beast and half man is that a prince must know how to act according to the nature of both, says Machiavelli. Oops, didn't mean to do that. I'll come back to this idea in a moment, but first I want to say more about Machiavelli's schema of human nature. So right at the beginning of the 16th century, in the fullness of the Renaissance, Machiavelli was still nonetheless very much a product of the medieval world. From this perspective, this is what human nature is. It, um, the world that we see and experience is as we see and experience it. It is now as it always has been. This is what enables people to perceive conditions of the present moment and judge them to be similar to the past. The, the human mind has very fixed ways, in other words, of operating when it experiences the world. Language and other cultural contingencies can vary over time and across cultures, but not people or what happens to them. That is constant. The world that we experience and our abstract ways of thinking about experience therefore remain constant in, from this perspective. For Machiavelli, ancient and classical examples were the same kinds of things as the present. That's why one sh should study the classics, because they taught us how to act in the present, since there was no change between humans then and now. Human nature, in other words, is always the same, as I said. Therefore, there is one truth for mankind, no matter what period of history or what culture they live in. The discovery of the new world challenged this view. Machiavelli's ideas first circulated, as I was saying, remember, at the beginning of my talk, roughly about 25 years after Columbus first reached the islands of what we now know as the Caribbean. Castilian conquerors had established a political and social system that worked terrifyingly well in conquering the Caribbean and subjugating its inhabitants. Hispaniola was, uh, 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 was discovered and, um, and then conquered in, uh, from 1493 to 1508, followed by Puerto Rico, then on to Jamaica, Cuba in 1511, 1511 and then Panama by uh, 1509. In these Caribbean lands, in other words, conquest, colonization, and exploitation meant the total domination of the native Arawak, Taino, and Caribbean peoples. And I just showed you here a, you know, a, a contemporaneous drawing from a rough, roughly this, this period where, you know, it's basically an allegory of a medical Vespucci discovering America, who is this, you know, native woman on a hammock enjoying paradise, uh, and the technology of Western Europe arrives to teach her what the world is really all about. Castilians, in this process of landing in the Caribbean and moving from island to island and finally on to the mainland in, in, in Panama, basically had developed a template for conquest. You know, they didn't invent the process each time that they went to a new land. They had found the process that worked, and this was the pattern that they would follow. It involved, one, enlisting native, native groups against one another. Two, using native, and especially women, captives as informants, translators, and the possibility for establishing allies. Three, forced conversion of native peoples to Christianity, then followed by the erasure of native history, and finally, a teaching of the natives to be sort of Europeans, facsimiles of Europeans. We know this in part because you know, there were many astonishing chronicles, and magnificent chronicles written about that process by many uh, uh, <coughs> Spanish participants in that process, but in particular, one astonishing chronicle by a man named Bernal Diaz de Castillo, who lived from 1492 to 1580, and who served as a lower level commander under Hernan Cortes in the campaign against the Aztecs. By the way, they never called themselves Aztecs, they called themselves Tenochtitlan or Mexica, thus Mexicanos, Mexicanos. Born in 1492, uh, Bernal Diaz decided to write his own true history when already in his 70s in the 1560s, he saw history being written by men who had never even been to America. In his true history of the conquest of New Spain, Bernal Diaz writes to set the record straight, especially about how common men like himself with their blood and steel 
had delivered heathen souls to the church and a mighty kingdom with unimaginable wealth and treasures to the king. He had been shocked to find out that the official history celebrating the great man uh, of, of Cortes gave little credit to the common soldiers, people such as he. That omission on the part of Cortes' biographer had, of course, not been an accident. Commissioned by the governor of Cuba, um, they were Velasquez to explore, map, and uh, report back. Hernán Cortés, uh, representative for you, landed in Yucatán on the Mexican peninsula, peninsula that you know, abuts onto the Gulf, the current Gulf of Mexico. He landed in Yucatán in February of 1519. So, in other words, right at the time that as uh, Machiavelli is compiling and, uh, uh, and putting together his ideas, Cortés made his way northward along the, the Mexican coast and took over the Spanish outpost of Veracruz in July of 1519. So Cortés's journey to Mexico was actually the third Spanish voyage to Mexico. From 1517 to 1518, two other expeditions had already landed in Mexico, but Cortés's was supposed to be simply one more to add to the knowledge, to you know, reconnoiter a little bit, to do some, some uh, preliminary exploring. Um, he started uh, he took over the Veracruz, the existing Spanish port, in 1519, and then started in, uh, in August of 1519. In earlier expeditions to Yucatan and the northern Mexican coast, Spaniards had encountered native people who were very different from those they had already met in the Caribbean. For the first time, they found ancient civilizations that were structured in hierarchical societies, organized in large kingdoms, and were able to defend their way of life. In many ways, the Spaniards and the Mexica whom they encountered in Mexico were well suited opponents. Both were the heirs of a long process of cultural development and fusion. Both had a warrior ethos. Both held fervently to a religious faith. And both justified their imperial expansion in terms of theological belief. Hernán Cortés was a man of his times who would have observed many of the same, absorbed many of the same lessons about how to get and keep power as Machiavelli. He put into practice, in other words, what Machiavelli was theorizing. Cortés was brave. He knew whom and how to flatter for greatest effect, how to stage dramatic events to terrify and awe his enemies. He was capable of imagining the grand design and also putting it into practical effect. Cortés was not an experienced battle commander. He was, however, he, he was, however, a political genius. He had extraordinary power to sustain a complex vision of the passion he enacted and the talent to control himself and others in that vision. In all of this, he was really incomparable. Cortés was, in other words, the very epitome of the new Machiavellian politician. By the time he arrived in Cuba, he had developed a reputation as a resourceful man capable and good with words, both uh, speech and writing. He had an uncanny ability to conceal his real intentions until the right moment. So in March of 1519, near Cozumel, according to Diaz's account, contrary to the wishes of his immediate superiors in Cuba, Cortes took formal possession of, Cuba, of Mexico. So in fact, in doing that, you know, he's, uh, he, uh, he's a pirate. You know, he has, he has, he's a traitor to the king. You know because he has disobeyed the direct orders of his superior in Cuba. He has a grander plan. Reconnoiter and scout and do a little bit of exploration? Not for me. What we're going to do is conquer this whole land. And that's what he sets out to do. Cortes had with him about 530 Europeans, including Castilians, Portuguese, Genoese, and Neapolitans, but primarily Castilians from Andalusia, from Castile and from Estremadura. He had, more importantly, than those 530 men, modern artillery, modern for the moment, of course. He had arquebuses, the original versions of assault rifles. He had fine Toledan steel swords, which had been manufactured and were famous for their, their efficacy since pre Roman times. Um, they had armor, they had fierce war dogs, and of course, they had horses for cavalry and for their supply trains. His superiors, as I said, had given him a very modest mission, reconnaissance and exploration. Cortes had other ideas. His banner, which I put up here for you, said in Latin, and this is a, 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 a reproduction of Cortes' banner. Amici sequa mortucem, esinos pitem ademus, 
vere e poxibus vincenus. Friends, let us follow the sign of the Holy Cross in true faith, for under this sign, this sign, we shall conquer. Having a good knowledge of law, as well as being a good Latinist from his time at the University of Salamanca, one of his favorite sayings was, Fortune favors the brave. Fortis fortuna adjuvit. A citation from Terence's the classical Roman author, play Formio. In Mexico, he begins his, uh, to hear marvelous tales about the great city of the Tenochtitlan, somewhere in Latin. Who were these people that we now refer to as the Aztec? As I said, they never referred to themselves as Aztecs. They called themselves Mexica, Tenochtitlan, the people from, uh, from Mexico, Mexico, and Tenochtitlan. For at least 2,000 years before the Spanish arrived in 1519, there had been flourishing civilizations in central Mexico and throughout Mesoamerica. The Mexica or, or Tenochtitlan were relatively newcomers to this region, having migrated from a region somewhere in the north, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas, a land that they called Aztlán. The ca their capital, situated on an island on Lake Texcoco, was a magnificent city. When the Europeans first saw it, as uh, Bernal Diaz, who was among you know, the, that first group of Europeans who, who um, you know, come across the passes and mountains and see Mexico City for the first time, when they see it for the first time, they were overcome with speechless admiration. They saw a floating city, you know, it reminded them of Venice, uh, resplendent with hanging gardens, teeming with markets, and a cold, and of course, everywhere they looked, gold. The Tenochtitlan had conquered and then integrated the island city of Tlatelolco, that created an alliance with uh, other lakeside cities like Texcoco and Tlacopan, and those three cities together, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan, became a triple alliance. But Tenochtitlan, the home of the Mexica, was always the senior partner and the predominant power. So by the beginning of the 16th century, by 1500, the Mexica Empire had spread throughout all of central Mexico, expanding northward and south as far as it could go. And it's at that very moment then that one of those lands in Mexico. It's so grand power is what, what the, the Tenochtitlan represents. But its power, while real, was also very fragile. Some neighboring peoples um, remained uh, politically independent and hostile to the nation. The Tarascans, I think I went too far in the next slide, so I'm coming back now to this. The Tarascans in Michoacan to the north were never conquered, um, and especially the, the Tlaxcalans to the east remained bitter enemies. At his Machiavellian best, Cortes persuaded the Tlaxcalans to side with him against the Mexica when he marched against Mexico City, promising, promising them equal share in war spoils and post-war power. What follows, of course, um, from that promise and the enactment of it is a horrifying chain of events that lead to the complete and utter destruction of the way of life. In order to deal with the Mayans, the Tlaxcalans, and finally the Mexicans, Cortes desperately needed help. He needed alliances with native peoples, of course, but first of all, he needed a reliable, knowledgeable informant and interpreter, someone who could translate the Mayan language, um, someone who could try and translate Mayan language and, and Mexican language, Nahuatl, as well as Spanish, someone who could take Cortes' duplicitous threats, his ambiguous promises, his outright lies, and communicate them accurately to the Mexicans without revealing the Spanish weaknesses or the deception. And there is a key figure, the interpreter, the translator, the go-between, an Indian woman who could speak Mayan, who could speak Nahuatl, and eventually learn Spanish. The woman whom the Spanish called Doña Marina, and whose Nahuatl name was not seen, plays the difficult role of the go-between in this very drama. We learn about her in, in the portion of Bernal Diaz's history titled Doña Marina's Story. In many places, Bernal Diaz speaks of her intelligence, her alertness, her courage. Without her, they could not have understood the language and culture of Mexico. Her story is directly linked to her gender. The daughter of Indian caciques, she had been given away by her parents when her mother remarried and bore her new husband a son. Later, she was one of 20 women presented to Cortez as part of a peace offering. 
And eventually she became Cortés's mistress as well as his translator and bore him a son, Don Martín Cortés, who, by the way, the second Don Martín Cortés, because Cortés's real or other wife, his Spanish wife, was in Cuba at the time with their other son, Don Martín Cortés. <laughs> so, so um, the way in which things do double up in the Americas. After the war, after the conquest of Mexico, Cortés gave her to another of his gentlemen, a man by the name of Juan Jaramillo. All of this is part of the historical record. Through Malancin, however, uh, Cortés learned the council, and here we have a representation of the black council with the flesh elements. The key fact that many of the peoples subject to the Mexica deeply resented the tribute imposed upon them, and that the city state, the state of Tlaxcala was at war with them, and in fact were looking for allies against the, the Mexica. Cortés understood what this meant. He astutely exploited these ethnic, political, and regional divisions to his own day. Now, I'm seeing uh, Doña Marina is an extreme figure, a symbol for celebrating, for the place of artful language, for rhetoric, and for intercourse at the center of the technology with which Europeans in the late 15th and early 16th centuries responded to the encounter with new peoples in new lands. She is an emblem, an emblem of the vast processes of cultural translation that the European conquest of the Americas required. Now it's hard to tell, um, it's hard to tell what Machiavelli would have thought about someone like Malitzin. Machiavelli thinks that, uh, remember as I was saying earlier, in his you know, uh, ideas about human nature, Machiavelli thinks that men change masters out of self-interest. Men do what other men do, they act by imitation, in other words. Men hurt one another through fear or hate. But, you know, this is constant, it's part of human nature, and this is very at all historically. Machiavelli, in other words, is a decidedly gendered view of humanity. What is more, there is no historical growth, as I said, in human nature. Men are, by nature, primarily self-interested, and what they take to be their interest is always material wealth and glory. When Machiavelli speaks of human nature and human conditions, uh, he is using men as his models of being. No men were part of his political world, either as citizens or as rulers, or as subjects of past historical narratives. From the prince, in other words, we have no way of knowing whether Machiavelli thought women behaved like men or had the same possibilities of duplicity as men. He simply didn't concern himself with, with them at all, except, of course, to refer to them unflatteringly uh, um, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, liking them or comparing them to fortune and fortune as a woman. Mm -hmm. Politics for Machiavelli is the art of dealing with fortune, fortuna. And fortuna is the direct force that shapes human events, as in this image that I'm showing you here uh, of uh, fortuna from uh, uh, an edition of Boccaccio's book on the fates of famous men. In the most notorious passages of the prince, Machiavelli is asking how the prince can impose form upon fortune and whether there is any moral quality in the power to do that. So how do we take, in other words, events in, in the world that are unmanageable and give them shape, control of ourselves, control of fortune? That is what uh, Machiavelli is attempting to do. So the prince is in great part about how to deal with fortune. In overthrowing an old established system the new prince opens the door to fortune. The new prince therefore requires exceptional, extraordinary qualities standing outside the norm. These qualities are precisely the ones that impose form on the fickleness of fortune. Situations created by fortune are not uniformly chaotic. There are strategic variations in circumstances and the prince is one who can devise strategies to take advantage of changing fortune. So the, the genius of the prince has to always be that, to see the way in which fortune is constantly changing and to seize the, the, the control of that change. This is the central idea and the central assertion of the prince, I think, that men and the world are not wholly predictable, wholly unpredictable, or unmanageable. The prince is the one, however, who best knows how to pursue his own ends without regard to any structure of law. Time and circumstance bring with them good things and bad things, unpredictably. The prince, in the end, is the man who can use his virtue and his power to discern what time is bringing, good fortune or bad, 
and what strategies are necessary to cope with that. He is not, uh, he is not immoral. I don't think um, uh, Machiavelli would, would have you know, uh, been uncomfortable with that word, but that's not the one that he's really interested in. He's interested only on practicality, on the practical, what will work. That is Machiavelli's legacy to modern politics, practicality. In Bernardias' descriptions of Cortes, we get the Machiavellian man who makes history in just this way. Cortes is not a man of fantasy or of wonder. He's not a millionaire, nor is he a particularly apocalyptic uh, person looking toward the end of time. Instead, he is a political realist and a pragmatic opportunist who uses his Christian beliefs and ideals for instrumental purpose. Cortes reflects the very essence, in other words, of the political philosophy of the Renaissance as embodied in the Prince Spaniel Machiavelli. These ideas lead us back to, you know, to something that I mentioned earlier, and that is to one of Machiavelli's key metaphors of the myth of the centaur. In the, the myth of the centaur, and in that allegory, we have the idea of the prince as duplicitous, as, two, as a two-sided creature, capable of fighting by law or by force, as I said earlier. For Machiavelli, as for the humanists of the Renaissance, the centaur symbolizes exactly that. Symbolizes the violence and the brutality of a man who denied the law of reason and turned him into a tyrant. The point for Machiavelli is that the prince must be both at once man and beast, capable of violence or reason, healing and destroying, depending on how the whims of fortune turn. In one of the most infamous passages of the prince, uh, in chapter 18, Machiavelli proposed that the prince should be loved and that he should be feared. But if he cannot be both loved and feared, then it is better to be feared. I'm not suggesting, remember, as I said earlier, that Cortes had read Machiavelli. For even though the prince was composed and circulated in manuscript around 1513, it wasn't published until 1532, well after the events that I was describing in Mexico. But the point is that Machiavelli did not invent the ideas that we now call Machiavelli. He is simply formulating in a systematic way a philosophy based on the notion that Christian morality and real world politics should be kept separate. We get a sense of how Hernán Cortés as a man of the high renaissance had imbibed Machiavellianism and offered a different way, of course, of responding to the new world just emerging. European imaginary modes, models, and structures of thinking are giving way to an emerging awareness of the inadequacy of old world idioms and schemas to convey new world realities. Cortes is the embodiment of the new Renaissance plan, the cold, hard political realist um, 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 is necessary for the new world that empire and conquest in the Americas requires. The clash of cultures in the, Ameri in, the, in the Americas led to an amazing event unique to the 16th century. The Renaissance arts of sculpture, of architecture, of painting, and the literary arts of poetry, narrative, all entered into dialogue, sometimes heated, angry dialogue with deadly implications, with traditions that had been cultivated by pre-Columbian civilizations for millennia. As I said, for 2,000 years, these civilizations had existed in Mexico, for instance. The emerging cultural hybridity between Europe and native American worlds produced wonders, such as the magnificent work compiled by Fray Bernardo de Sahagún in a book that he entitled Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva España, or General History of the Things of New Spain. This book, um, the, the, you know, the image which I've uh, shown you now a, a little uh, you know, colored and, and blown up um, example from, is part of that book. The other name for this book is the Florentine Codex. The Florentine Codex is held today in the Biblioteca Medicea Lorenziana here in Florence. Mm -hmm. The manuscript became part of um, the collection of the library at some point after its creation in the late 16th century. And, but it wasn't rediscovered for use by scholars again until the end of the 18th century. In any case, Sahagún, um, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, um, in his Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva España, writes an encyclopedia, an encyclopedic work about the people and culture of Mexico compiled by Mexican artists 
and scholars trained by Fray Fernando de Sarabón, a Franciscan missionary who arrived in Mexico in 1529, in other words, eight years after the, uh, the, the destruction of Mexico and the conquest by Cortes in, um, in 1521. Uh, imagine that, and, and you know, what, think of the importance of that. Here, basically, we have, you know, in the authoring of this book by, and taught by this man, the first cohort of native intellectuals in the U.S. We taught them how to gather, um, how to interview, how to write, how to translate, and how to create an encyclopedia. Um, commonly referred to, as I said, as the, as the Florentine Codex, the manuscript consists of 12 books devoted to different topics. Book 10, for instance, I'm giving you some examples of the pictographs, the, the images that are, that are part of book 10, is about Mexica society and covers of such subjects as the virtues and vices of ordinary people, their food, their drink, the parts of the human body, the illnesses that they are prone to and remedies for, for treating them. And here, as I said, are some, some facsimiles from the Florentine Cortex. There are many links between Machiavelli, Cortes, and Sarabun's Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva, Nueva España, ideas concerning education, political power, and the political agency of books. One of the most amazing parts of this, of this uh, codex, of this book that Sarabun created with the use of native uh, scholars, was that it's really a book in four languages. It's in the pictographs that I was showing you. It also includes Nahuatl text, so it was the first time that Nahuatl was, was put into uh, Roman script, and Spanish, so three languages, excuse me. And uh, you know, side by side, so you get the pictures, the Nahuatl, and the Spanish, so that there is a compendium of information across that whole panoply of, of, of discourses. In partnership with Nahuatl men, Chica men, who were formerly his students at the Colegio de Santa Cruz at Tlateroico, on the remains of Mexico City, in other words, Sahagun conducted research, he organized evidence, he wrote and edited his findings, starting in 1545 until his death in 1590. The work consists of 2,400 pages organized into 12 books, more than 2,000 illustrations, such as the ones that I've given you just a few examples of, drawn by native artists, and often vivid images of the era. It documents the culture, religious cosmology, the worldview, the religious practices, ritual practices, society, economics, and the natural history of the Aztec world. Works such as Sahagun's compiled, painted, and translated by native artists raise the whole series of questions, such as to what extent, on what level, and at what cost could local native artists, writers, and intellectuals manage to reconcile the irreconcilable native and European worlds? In other words, how could they juggle two ways that seem to have nothing in common at the outset? In Machiavelli, Cortes, and Sahagun, and in works you know, of, of, of all sorts of periods, say like uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest, which, which has vivid moments, really talking about exactly these same things as well. We see politics in these works as an aesthetic practice. The relationship between political power and aesthetics, especially the aesthetic form of knowledge in books, it is, a, it is a significant and powerful. In Machiavelli's formulation, politics is a human endeavor that is rooted in individuals' desire to impose their imprint upon particular situations of things. In order to shape their world, individuals must use means to represent ideas, sometimes misrepresent motives, carefully imitate past deeds and actors, and mobilize people through the rhetorical manipulation of emotional reactions. All this for the grand aim of giving lasting form to a particular state, political struggle, or to shape the course of the movement. The arrival of Europeans in the Americas precipitated a bitter and deadly clash between high Renaissance European culture and the extremely sophisticated indigenous forms of thought, an expression represented by the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Incas. Europeans, for good and ill, spread humanist values and attempted to translate, transplant the religious, aesthetic, um, and intellectual accomplishments of the European Renaissance onto American soil. Well. Even though this cultural clash occurred in the form of colonization and domination, never, nevertheless it provoked a local cultural reaction of remarkable quality and diversity. 
The efforts of the generations of people of the Conquest era and the following beginning of the colonial era resulted in the development of new forms during the 16th century that continue with us today. So despite the Machiavellian motives of men like Edmond Cortez, the Conquest did not simply produce a subjugated world. Instead, indigenous Americans did not simply become passive spectators of the spirit, oblivious to power. They learned from Cortes and from the, the Machiavellian motives themselves. Instead, they, and they actively created, sometimes under great duress, and then wrenchingly communicated the transformation and Europeanization of a way of seeing that struggled to remain faithful to ancient traditions. And this is a struggle, really, that remains with us today. That Machiavelli, I think, would certainly recognize. Anyway, thank you thank very you much. So much. on Machiavelli, but uh, what I've heard today is really, really new and original and something I've never heard before, so I'm really, really pleased, and I was also very much wondering about what the connection between these two <laughs> could be, and you say you provided a wonderful uh, bridge, and, 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 and so thank you very much, and let's open it up for questions uh, or comments. Uh, yes. Ramon, that was oh, Ramon, that was wonderful. Like then, I so many things I had no idea about just really opened up um, my thinking. Um, oh, I'm curious about when did um, Machiavelli become Machiavelli? I mean, when and did Machiavellianism become this sure. uh, phenomenon? I mean, I, I'm just adding as a psychologist, we have a scale, a, a test. Yeah. that you give to people because you want to make sure that you yeah. don't have um, people with high scores on Machiavellianism in your corporate world or whatever. Uh, and it's very yeah, you know, it's mean. The, no essence, the essence of it is somebody who just um, is, is not at all a moral person. You know, they're always, you can't trust anything they do. It's, it's, it's the ends. Sure. Always justify the means. And so there's mm-hmm. nothing good, no positive resonance, mm-hmm. I think, if you would ask mm-hmm. most people in the social sciences at all. And so, but when did it happen? When did that happen? Because at the time, there really wasn't, from what you're saying, he was just kind of codifying yeah. the yeah. smart way to, sure. to, to be. There really wasn't another yeah. model, was yeah. there? Yeah. Well, there isn't, you know, so I can't give you an exact date or anything like that because, you know, and, and it's, and, you know, the easy answer would be to say it happened with Machiavelli. I think that's a wrong answer because, you know, it obviously already exists, you know, just simply part of the ideas of the moment. You know, uh, probably, you know, going back even a time before Machiavelli's actual living, yeah. living time. I think that, that um, and I wanted to want sort of the sub ideas of what I was trying to present is that it's part and parcel of the transformation of a way of thinking that is, you know, both political and economic and social and cultural that comes with the end of the Middle Ages. In other words, with the coming of humanism. So, you know, when you shift away from that universal value system to a value system that is uh, situating itself on the changeability and instability of of human motives and human thinking, something gives, and many, many positive things emerge from that. Uh, you know, we, we celebrate humanism rightly, mm-hmm. but I think one of the things that also comes with it is sort of the, the flip side, and that is that um, um, that if things that if motives in the world are determined by their practical ends and the practical result, then he usually he always he in this context. He who has the right to determine what the appropriate practical end is will be the one who determines you know, what will happen. And so it's that part of what comes hand in hand with the life, light-giving power of humanism with the Renaissance. My, my, so if I were to place it, you know, so we're talking here, you know, um, you know, 1513, 1517, Probably a hundred years earlier, it was already well underway, and, and I think you know that's part of the historical flow 
and flux of uh, the European, uh, the end of the European Middle Ages and the beginning of the European Renaissance in the 1300s and well into the 1400s. So by the time that Machiavelli on, comes on the scene, it's almost like he's a late comer. You know, he's a late comer to his own idea. <laughs> yes. So um, I thank you for your wonderful talk, and I, I have seen that with a lot of scholars that a lot of times. Um, what you realize is that the ideas were in the air, and then often for quite a long time, and then someone comes along, and because of the way they say it, uh, to whom they dedicated, as you uh, indicated it, um, the, the rhetoric, the powerful, the word, you know, the rhetoric that they use to convey, you know, they just maybe where they publish it, like all of these things, it becomes the statement, yeah. right? But I'm just, I want to go back to the gender issues which yeah. you brought up so interestingly and which I very much enjoy. Yeah, I can only touch on, so yes. I'm glad you're, you're Yes, well, back. it just occurred to me that, um, like you said, uh, Machiavelli is only talking about men, right? He really doesn't take women into account. But, you know, it, it's absolutely without doubt that the, um, that the conquest of the Americas could not have happened with the role of women in, in coming from the particular position that they were in. And so, you know, it would be interesting, you know, I wonder what a check, what, if the analysis that Machiavelli had given us had thought about how people act when they're in positions of, uh, when, you know, um, subordination, right? Because you think about somebody like Manancini or Doña Marina, you know, she is not acting really in her own naked self-interest in a, I mean, she's really acting from a position of subordination. So I was just wondering if you would speculate more about, yeah. you know, yeah. um, about that. You know? Sure, well, I'll just say a little bit, and then maybe I'll open that up to further further questions, but um, um, a couple of things occurred to me. First of all, Machiavelli is not being completely historically accurate because you remember who financed Columbus's journey to uh, the end of exploration, that Ferdinand, Ferdinand and Isabella from Spain. Yeah. And Isabella, as a you know, reigning queen, actually, you know, um, she brought power to uh, Fernando. So, you know, uh, so there were models of you know, reigning sovereign women rulers. But uh, I'm sure that um, Machiavelli's um, response would be those are the exceptions. There are so few that, you know, in reality, we're talking about a much more significant, larger number of people. But I, but I think that, that that's the point. That um, one major critique of that that is perfectly and maybe necessary, doable to the, to the implicit politics and morality that Machia Machiavelli represents is just that: how power and action and the control of fortune is possible when you don't have the power, when you're not in a position to enact the shaping of fortuna. Uh, and we certainly know that it can happen. But it does happen. It isn't necessarily to happen. Um, but he doesn't realize that. Yeah. That's why I, I thought it was worth spending a little bit of time on two instances that are, I think, following some of Machiavelli's ideas, but in a very, very different way. One is Dona Marina herself, Malencine, and her ability to, you know, she, she, uh, she was a native speaker of Maya, learn Nahuatl, and then learn Spanish. You know, and use that as um, as, as her, her, her 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 mode of making her way in the world. I think she's a native speaker of knowledge. You're right. Mind. I have knowledge. You're right. It's the other way around. You're right. In any case, the, the learning of the languages, and and then the other example of Bernardino of, of the Sahagun and and his enlistment of native intellectuals, training native intellectuals to write the history of their own conquest, right? So what is entailed in that? And what inflections were introduced into that history by the fact that those suffering the conquest were given some access to writing that history? Well, um, Sahagun made the brilliant and, and really historical important discovery that um, the, the men and women who had lived through the destruction of their civilization were dying out. You know, so um, uh, how do you capture that oral knowledge? Because the libraries have been destroyed. One of the things that very Machiavellian rule, the Cortes did on the first day after Mexico City was, was captured, 
was he gathered all the intellectuals, the native intellectuals. He gathered them, in particular authors and librarians, and he literally threw them to the dogs. They were ripped apart by the war dogs. Then they assembled all of the, of the books and they burned them. So what was left were a few fragments of, 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 of those books that exist in libraries scattered around the imperial colonial world. Um, and when Sangun understood that he wasn't going to get the direct knowledge because that generation was now dying out. Those who had survived were dying out. But their children had survived. And so he trained the, the young scholars, again men, young boys, into the process of Renaissance scholarship and taught them how to do it, how to assemble it, how to create this magnificent work that exists right here in Florence. One of the things that I was using throughout my thinking about this project was how we think of what happens in other parts of the world as so distant from us. But what this shows is the intertwined interrelationship of European Renaissance Florence and the events of Mexico and Central America, Latin America generally, and soon, of course, will enter the event to North America as well. But that flow was not one way. It was an interactive, inter, uh, uh, <coughs> inter uh, connected. connected way, exactly, that affected in two directions. And we see remnants of power. Of course, all um, within the, the way that, that uh, Paula describes it, with very different distributions of power. There are those who are subaltern and those who have power. But nevertheless, the subaltern and the subjugated are not totally without the ability to act and determine their own history of the world. I was also, I think what you're saying is very, very interesting. And one of the parts of the talk that surprised me a lot is the fact that at the Biblioteca La Valenciana here, that would be that codex, and how yeah. precisely, as you say, there's a this cross pollination, it's a two way street yes. uh, between the two cultures. But I want to go back to the notion of femininity and masculinity. For the many talks that I heard from Michael, never have I heard somebody mention, you know, it's modeled on a male only. You know, parameter, which is about parameter. And the uh, only woman, you know, of relevance in the book is actually La Fortuna, which is feminine in Italian. But the Fortuna is depicted in the book as something, you know, or somebody who's volatile, changes yes. her mind, okay. should not be trusted, and, you know. And so, so with our typical ways in which femininity yes. has been described, you know, being a lunatic and being. Yes. A little out of yes, out of control, and you don't know, you know, it's unpredictable, and so on and so forth. And then, and yet, La Fortuna is the enabler, because when the Fortuna touches the prince, it, 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 enables, it enables him to, to uh, you know, hold the power to have the power. It seems to me that Malinzin's role is also that of an enabler in some capacity, so there's that connection as well, that Machiavellian uh, sort of scenario that you've depicted, is, you know, she's not the fortuna for her case, but she is a neighbor, is a translator, is somebody who's, yeah. who's, who's helping him, you know, exercise his power, get some yeah. information uh, from, from, from with these people and from these people, so. No, you're exactly right. Um, you know, there may be something more, right, or something else, you know, and it's clear in the case of the, the Indian woman, the Aztec woman, uh, on that scene, no one is going to be that it is in the allegory of Fortuna, and that is that um, um, she basically serves as language, you know, sort of as the medium, as the medium for content. For, uh, for content. Uh, it is through her that the, the communication uh, happens at all. Now, it would have happened in other ways, and in, 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 in the Sala, it's absolutely unique, but in effect, she becomes representative of the power of language to make a connection across two abysses. In fact, she becomes so central to that operation, and she's always with Cortez, that the Indians start calling Cortez Marina and Marina, because they think that you know, the two are one, that you know, the, the, the discourse which she speaks to him and then back to them through her, um, 
He reminds them in such a close way. But anyway, yes. So then that, uh, 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 an enabler, but also um, a connector between the two. Yes. Can you go back to that slide about human nature? I'm, 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 I'm interested. So, is this the view that was the prevailing view? I, I mean, not, not the prevailing in the sense that people would openly admit this. You know, but I think uh, what Machiavelli is doing is sort of boiling down the prevailing view and saying, you know, these are all covered over with uh, layers of magnificent ethical and morality, ethics and morality. But when you strip that away, what you're left with is self-interest. And um, I'm not sure that, that, that um, you know, it's fair of him to think that that is really what characterizes all human action. Well, that's but, what most but, but that's what he. And that's today. Sure. That's the sure. economic today, view you know, of the person, which is, you know, the dominant view, absolutely. really. But, yeah. so what would you say was the view, what's the other view? And who had the other, did, well, did they was, assume that the Romans had another view? Well, the other view them? is precisely what you could imagine. And that is that um, men are weak, they are ignorant, they are selfish, but they can be taught differently. They can be led, they can be shaped differently. And that is the function of various institutions. You know, religion, uh, the state, uh, education, um, you know, family structures. They're, those are all elements that we have created as part of the grand structure of helping human nature achieve what it is capable of achieving. Machiavelli's view is, um, don't kid yourself. When, you know, what you're left with always is a veneer of that, that what stays constant and powerful is ultimately self-interest, even if it's layered over with, um, you know, uh, beautifying uh, ethical markets. And you know, remember what he's modeling at the time. He's modeling his belief in a um, hundred years of Florentine history, you know, and, and the, the history of the, of the papacy and of the Medici, you know, who were his patrons and uh, and whom he was pleading to in, the, in his book to help draw him back into Florence from his exile in the countryside. Yeah. Grazie mille. Thank you so much.